Knock, knock. Who's there? Kyoto. Kyoto who? I'll kyo to any lengths to get Mr. Bruce to stop telling terrible Japanese jokes. Ha 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 I'm thinking I'm going to start off a lot of these videos by making really funny jokes because that's how I roll. You guys know I'm, I'm a really funny teacher and <clears throat> as you're recovering from your laughter right now, I just want to let you know that when you open up a video, be prepared because there might be a few jokes. Okay. Um, <clears throat> we are on, let's see, chapter 12, section four, Japan under the shoguns. So in the last class, uh, which was a few days ago, or before the long weekend, uh, we were learning about the rise of feudalism and how um, the conflict between the Taira and the Minamoto clans and the rise of the Fujiwara family through intermarriage with the Japanese royal family had the twin results of basically getting rid of the power of the Japanese emperor for the rest of its civilization. The emperor does come back here and there a few times, but uh, never quite rises to the same level of power he had in early medieval Japan. And then also it has the effect of giving rise to feudalism. So remember, feudalism is a system of, it's a social class system of land ownership in which you have a small number of lords that control large amounts of land and have control of small armies that kind of protect that land and occasionally go to war or go to battle with other uh, lords to try to acquire some of their land, right? So uh, you have a small group of lords that control all, all the land, and then you have uh, a very large population of um, what are going to be called serfs. So when we get to Europe, we're going to call them serfs. These are people who are legally obligated to work for the lord because uh, they have given up land, property, or freedom in exchange for protection. Right? So they work on the Lord's land, usually as farmers, sometimes as soldiers. Uh, the Lord will protect them, will give them a house to live in, will let them take a portion of the harvest that they grow, uh, will make sure they're fed and make sure their children are taken care of. But in exchange, they essentially have very little freedom. All right, so feudalism is going to be the dominant way that societies are organized, not only in Japan, but also in Europe when we get to Europe next. All right. Um, we also learned about Minamoto Yoritomo. He was a member of the Minamoto clan who becomes Japan's first shogun. And remember, he's a shogun because the sword, mirror, and jewel are lost at sea and um, he will not be accepted as an emperor. No one's going to see him as a descendant of the gods. They're going to see him as a military figure who kind of, um, through sheer military power, is controlling Japan. So Minamoto Yoritomo becomes the de facto ruler of Japan, not as an emperor, but as a shogun. All right. So under the shoguns, uh, the feudalist society dominates Japan. So shoguns are the most powerful people in Japan, uh, but unlike the emperors, they don't have absolute control over everything in Japan because power is lo largely located in the different regions, wherever um, a daimyo is. All right, so we're gonna start off with samurai. So samurai are guided by a code called Bushido. So it's basically an honor code or a warrior code by, with, by which uh, the samurai live their lives, right? So it guides the samurai warrior and it's controlled by two basic ideas. Number one, personal honor. And number two, loyalty to the daimyo, right? So a lot of samurai... Uh, believe that their purpose in life is to fulfill the Bushido code, right? And a lot of samurai believe that the best way to do this is to die honorably in battle while serving the daimyo. 
right? So being loyal to the daimyo is more important than being loyal to the shogun. It's more important than being loyal to Japan. It's more important than being loyal to your family, right? What your daimyo needs comes first. Right? The shogun, Japan, your family, yourself, you all come after your service to the daimyo. Um, so the samurai uh, were basically willingly controlled by this Bushido code, this warrior code, and they presented themselves, their, their physical appearance was an important way to demonstrate that they were following the Bushido code. So they put a lot of emphasis on their appearance. Right. Now, as we're learning this, you might think that the samurai and Mr. Bruce have a lot in common. Um, many students in the past have thought that about me as well. Uh, I, I take it as a compliment. Um, I think it's a pretty obvious comparison to make. I mean, these are ferocious warriors who take very careful, pay very careful attention to their appearance, just like I do. So, you know, we have a lot in common. So, yeah. Feel free to make that comparison all you want. Okay, so a samurai's honor was demonstrated by his armor, his sword, his horse, and his general appearance. Um, <clears throat> so quick note, I don't think this is in the slides, but the samurai believed that their soul was contained within the, their sword. So losing your sword was a really big deal. You had to take really good care of your sword. Also, um, when they would run into battle, they would make sure that their enemies and their allies knew who they were. So they would run into battle and they'd shout out their name, right? They put, if they had a family uh, crest or image, they would put that on their, their armor so that people know, okay, the representative from this family fought in this battle and died fulfilling Bushido, died protecting the daimyo. Okay. Um, now, uh, in the second half of section four, it talks about something called the Mongol invasion. Right. So remember, for a long time, China has been in significant decline. And by the year 1200, uh, a tribe called the Mongols takes control of China. And uh, these Mongols are ruled by a guy named Kublai Khan, right? Kublai Khan is one of the most fearsome warriors and rulers in all of history, right? And he had this massive, powerful army, and he was threatening Japan. And he said uh, he demanded that Japan pay tribute to Kublai Khan and the Mongols. And in exchange, Kublai Khan was like, maybe I'll leave you guys alone. Maybe I won't invade Japan and take all of your territory, right? Well, the shogun of Japan at that time refused Kublai Khan's request. And Kublai Khan got really insulted by this refusal, right? So Kublai Khan uh, threatened and prepared to invade Japan. So in the year 1274, Kublai Khan sends something called an armada to invade Japan. Now, an armada is a large fleet of ships that carry warriors, right? It's an invading naval force. So he sends this massive armada to invade Japan. And all of these warriors are carrying weapons from China and, and armor and, and uh, other things from China that Japanese military forces have never seen before. So the Japanese are in a really bad spot, right? Compared to the Armada, there's much fewer of them, right? The Armada contains the most powerful military force in the world at this time. Um, in fact, some of the weapons that the Armada has are bombs, right? Because Japan is using gunpowder and weapons for the first time. Um, and so the Armada is loaded up with bombs and um, not guns yet, but they do have uh, more powerful uh, weapons overall than, than Japan does. However, the Japanese have one advantage, right? They have samurai as part of their uh, military force, right? And the samurai are very fierce, skilled warriors who think that the best thing that could possibly happen to them is for them to die in battle, 
right? And so they defeat the Mongols in the first attack. The Mongols are kind of shocked at how fierce, fearless, and willing to die these uh, Japanese samurai are, right? And they retreat. And during their retreat, see, they're retreating and they're planning to kind of like regroup and attack again. But during the retreat, there's a big storm that happens at sea. And most of the surviving armada is drowned. All right. Um, so in 1281, Kublai Khan is going to send a second larger armada. Right. And the Japanese are losing despite the ferocity of the samurai and their abilities in battle. They're at a huge disadvantage because now there's even more soldiers. And so the Japanese start to pray to their gods for help. And out of nowhere, there's this big typhoon that comes and destroys their armada, right? So for two times in a row, the weather has basically saved Japan from invasion, right? And Japanese believe this is a miracle, and this ends the Mongol threat. All right, we're going to stop there, and with the next video, I will pick up with what happens next. Very exciting. Samurai Bruce 